Good to talk to you again, John. Good to see you. Many of your supporters, and indeed many of your opponents, will probably want to know what you've been doing for this last six months, especially as, as it's been overshadowed by the, the pandemic. But before we get on to that, I'd just like to talk to you about your election victory, which was stunning and historic, what it meant to your family, and indeed the atmosphere uh, at the time of your election last December. It, I think being honest, it still sinks in um, as the weeks and months passed since December. The night itself, and even the days after, I think the best way to describe it was surreal. Um, arguably, the impact of it was felt more by others than me. I suppose I, I, I being caught in the middle of it, it was it was very strange. But the day itself of the election, I can't remember seeing anything like that in, in North Belfast. And I would struggle to think in my time of other elections that were like that. There was a real buzz and an energy in North Belfast. There were queues. 10, 15 minutes long for polling stations that I'd never seen before in North Belfast. And I think at that moment during the day, um, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little bit nervous and excited, thinking this could actually this could actually happen, we could do this. And after after 10 o'clock when the polls closed, um, went back and got something to eat and then I, I went and we were waiting with a friend of mine. And I think at that stage, people in the party knew that it was going to happen, but... They kept me in the dark <laughs> until until the last minute. Um, they let me know look, that it, it was going to happen. Um, I, I think I think if it was going to happen, I thought it would be a lot tighter. I didn't think that it would be close to two thousand votes, but I think that you know talking to people afterwards, the change in North Belfast politically, even in the past two three years, is huge, and I think that has really impacted on people. They see that the divisive politics of the past is something that doesn't need to be there, that they can do something about it. We saw that in the Assembly election in 2017. Um, we got a hint of that in the Westminster election in 2017. And, you know, the, the election in December was was huge. And it, Quite dirty at times, given some of the things that were said, and hurtful things that were said about your family, but just no doubt about it, you certainly caught the mood of the zeitgeist anyway mm. in the in the in, in the nationalist community it was an extraordinary victory and now you've got mp after your name uh tell me about your work and how you have approached your work on the ground for example how do people manage to contact you with constituency matters at this time of self-isolation yeah so the we, we don't have the constituency office yet um the lockdown in march put that on hold a little bit so there's that barrier where people can't physically walk into your office but I suppose the times that we're in at the minute people are you know we're very contactable I, I like to think that I'm as accessible as I as I can be before lockdown we actually started an, on, an online constituency clinic where every Wednesday people would contact me I would be there at the computer and they would contact me by Facebook or Instagram um Lockdown as well, we had posters and banners up around North Belfast letting the public know our contact details, um, whether that was you know anything from advice regarding businesses or jobs or whether there were people who were vulnerable and shielded and needed you know needed to make sure there were food in their cupboard. Um, so you on, did you work with the food banks? Yeah, yeah and so we're, we're in the Dunkern today and you know the Dunkern under Bill Shaw have been amazing. They, without even a moment's hesitation, opened up their building to the community food bank, which would normally be based in Ardoin. And the response from from public and private, so we got some money from council, we got some money from Dirty Hargy's department, um, and the response that people contacted me, people who were business owners who could afford to give back, but didn't have a connection to North Belfast, but saw what was going on and were contacted and saying, look, I can supply you... Uh, with a truckload of Easter eggs, making sure the kids get Easter eggs at Easter. I can supply you with this. I can supply you with that. So the operation here, was, you know, was really good, and it just hit everywhere in North Belfast. Um, so I'd have been in here most days. You'd have been out doing deliveries, and and we weren't. I mean, I think it's important to say we, we weren't the only food bank in North Belfast. Um, there was a food bank operating out of Crusaders on the Show Road that were servicing the community really well. There was the North Belfast Advice Partnership, which was in Holy Cross Boys. So there was lots was it of cross community distribution. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it it was need based. Um, so that was the only you know that was the only thing that people were interested in. If there was a need there, then the work was making sure that that need was met. Um, 
and it was referral based as well. I think that, you know, I don't know whether it's an Irish thing or a Belfast thing, but people who sometimes need help don't tend to ask for it. Um, but what was, you know, I think it was really good to see from a community point of view that people would phone and say, look, there's an elderly neighbour whose family aren't able to visit him anymore. I'd be a bit worried about him. I'm not too sure if he'll be able to get things or, you know, there's a single mother or there's, you know, people for whatever circumstances were being referred. And when you would go to leave food there, they'd be quite overwhelmed because the penny would drop that there's people around them that are looking out for them. Um, you know, the fact that food banks are necessary is a shame and a blight on, on all of us in society. But the response during lockdown, I, I thought, was was fantastic, particularly in North Belfast. Well, as the pandemic hopefully eases and the uh, lockdown uh, ceases, what do you see in terms of your workload for the next two to three or four years? given Johnson's overall majority. Yeah. It's like <coughs> this parliament will run full term. Yeah, and, and that's true. You know, whenever the dust settled after the election in December, you know, the majority that, that, that the Tory government had, I suppose, brings a little bit more stability to the term, um, as opposed to Theresa May's victory or Theresa May's election in 2017. There are going to be your day-to-day constituency matters that we deal with, and we, and we are very busy with that. But I think the bigger... The bigger projects that North Belfast, I think, needs to focus on, there are a number of them. Um, we have our unfair share of a mental health crisis. Um, we've very high suicide. Yeah, we and, and we've witnessed that even during lockdown. And I think people are very well aware of the tragic cases. There needs to be that investment. My view on that is that mental health isn't a health issue primarily and during lockdown I would have met with um, by, by Zoom with the Education Minister Peter Weir, the Justice Minister Naomi Long and, and I was at pains to say in the context of other matters that they should be budgeting and setting aside money for mental health. Um, people who go through the criminal justice system by and large have mental health issues but just because you have a mental health issue. Familiar with that, yes I'd be familiar with that with you know with my work and people who are you know who, who suffer badly don't get the help or don't get the option of a diversionary path to take in life, then they can end up in the criminal justice system. They can be recidivists. They can be in jail. And, you know, to be crude in an economic point of view, it's a hell of a lot more expensive to lock somebody up in McGabry or McGilligan or Hyde Bank year after year than it is to put money into a community service that could perhaps allow them a different path. Again, education. I think that, you know, there needs to be money specifically set aside and ring-fenced in education so that emotional well-being um you know i think teaching teaching children how to be a little bit more resilient understanding their emotions and dealing with things a lot better and in my time as mayor i saw some fantastic projects especially in north belfast as well um primary school kids who who would be who were being taught techniques that you know i've never been taught um that i think a lot of adults could probably benefit from um we also, I think, in North Belfast, there are so many, I mean, there's so, so much on top resource here. You know, I think that we have, with my biased hat on, we've the most, we've been beautiful natural resource in, in Belfast with the Cave Hill. I think we need to see how we can market that to make sure that it is a, a big tourist attraction whilst preserving the integrity of the environment. Um, we need to do something with our court, the Crumlin Road Courthouse when right across the road you can see the success that the jail has been in attracting people and doing things that are imaginative. We've Clifton, um, Clifton um, Graveyard, which again is a fantastic piece of history in Belfast, history oh, art. Which Tom Bartley's writing another. Another book, yeah. And you know, it's sad that the only way that you can learn about that is by reading a book, that you can't actually go in and visit it the way you can with perhaps Milltown or the City Cemetery uh, or other cemeteries. This is my history hat coming on now. Um, but you know, we do have natural resources there. We need to figure out how we can open those up and make them more attractive so people can come up in, into North Belfast. We need to look at housing. We need to look at infrastructure. I think the um, you know we've been pushing that the glider um, needs to make Belfast a lot, or needs to make North Belfast, sorry, more connected. And you know one thing that has been topical, and I spoke on this recently with the BBC, is the York Street interchange. I think we need to be a little bit more imaginative as to how we deal with that major infrastructural project. Was the money was the money ring fenced for that project? The, yeah, there was, and th- there have been some interesting discussions that. Um, that, that I've had with people who are coming at this from a slightly different angle who think that there's a way of doing this that would not only be cheaper but would be better for the communities what you know what you can't have and I, I suppose it was it was 
a byproduct of the M2 in the West Link originally. You can't cut off communities like Sailor Town or other areas in North Belfast and just leave them to wither on, on the vine. Um, we have to make, you know, the Belfast City Council um, agenda is to make Belfast more connected. It's to have more people living in the city centre and city centre would cover North Belfast. So if you're talking around near the docks area, that's not going to be attractive for any person to live in, whether it's social housing or whether it's it's um, you know private housing, if you're completely cut off, if you have to walk, th- if you have to walk through seven sets of traffic lights to walk your child to school, never mind the quality of that air along that walk. So there are a number of of projects in North Belfast that I want to commit to, and I want to make sure that you know in the office of MP that we're putting a lot of pressure to make sure that we move on because sadly North Belfast is still top of all the tables you don't want to be top of. We're bottom of a lot of the tables that you don't want to be bottom of. It's also, of course, top of the tables when it comes to uh, legacy and mm-hmm. the number of killings in North Belfast. I mean, it was actually called Murder Mail yeah. uh, during the conflict. And of course, we have deadlock on legacy. Mm-hmm. How do you think that this can be uh, resolved? Legacy is... Um, it's difficult. I think that that, that puts it very mildly. Um, obviously, we have our own family campaign, so I've lived this in a, in a very specific way for over 30 years. There needs to be, and it's easier said than done, the toxicity around the debate. There is an onus on, I think, particularly political leaders, uh, but anybody who would be a leader within their community to do their best to take the toxicity out of this. I could easily have... A conversation or a debate on legacy and poke my neighbour in the eye if that's what I wanted to do. I could rip out wounds and make sure that that conversation was as hurtful as possible. But what follows on from legacy, and I don't think enough people remember this, uh, is reconciliation. So if we are serious about having a society where I can respect your view in the past, which will be different from mine, I can respect your constitutional view, which will be different from mine, but we remember that we're neighbours, that we both live in the same street, in the same community. We both want good schools. We both want job opportunities for children. We want to live in a better society. You're not going to do that if you go out of your way to make the legacy to be a toxic. And that in no way should undermine or erode your own view of the past. I don't think anybody wants to whitewash or remove an opinion or a narrative or somebody's personal history and personal story that's not what i want but there is an onus particularly in north belfast and we saw that even over the weekend um whereby sectarianism is still very rife in this society and that is a challenge for everybody and i do think that political discourse plays into that quite a lot and it's very easy to whip up tensions especially as we're moving into the summer um but I do think that with leadership, we do see a society moving out of that. Well, the British government, of course, is reneging on the mm-hmm. pension payment, which I think is £100 million. That, of course, brings us on to the question of the threat from Brexit, mm-hmm. which is going to proceed because the British government have said that they're not going to seek an extension for the withdrawal agreement. Yeah. So how do you see that, the economic effect of Brexit, uh, not just on Ireland as a whole, but particularly in your constituency in North Belfast. Brexit, you know, I suppose going back to the beginning of our conversation with the election last year, Brexit was huge. Um, people, North Belfast um, didn't vote for Brexit, like so many areas in, in the North. Um, it's going to be disastrous for, for the economy here. The Tory government have said many things since the referendum in 2016. Not all of them have come to pass. So we will wait and see how they approach these negotiations. But there was a real fear, even even in the election of 2017, but also the council election of, of last year and again in, in the Westminster election. People, people, I think, were awakened to what exactly their European identity meant, whether that was a child going to university in the South, whether that was family and friends or the dividend from a peace process that perhaps wasn't recognised because you just became so used to it. The fact that the Tory government have reneged, even on giving the the, um, the European Union a, a base here in Belfast to oversee the implementation of the Irish Protocol, it is very clear that they do petty. not care. It's petty, but it's... Well, petty would almost, I, I think... I think Petty lets them off the hook. I think it's deliberate. I think it is a very deliberate snub and it's a contempt shown to people here. And it doesn't matter 
who you vote for, what your constitutional outlook is, there is nothing but contempt shown to people here on this island. And I think that is, that's something that we all have in common, whether you voted DUP or Sinn Féin or none of the above or whoever, whatever your politics are, you will be treated by uh, with contempt by a British government. Not just in terms of legacy, not just in terms of Brexit, but in terms of so many different aspects, um, especially our economical situation. And I think people have started to really see that. Brexit has been a catalyst where people will see... I mean, I, I spoke to somebody... I've said this a few times. I spoke to somebody uh, very senior in the, in, in the legal world and she described to me the society which England is becoming and the path that it was going down. And she realised that she had nothing in common with that. Now, this is somebody who would have been, a, you know, who would be a unionist. And she would look in, in society in Belfast and even to the south and would feel much more in common with that. Um, and I think that the society that the Tory government is set on creating in England is something that we have power to distance ourselves from. And I think that is a debate that Brexit has been a catalyst for, an accelerant for, and I think that shows the exciting times that we're in politically. Well, the, the, the protocol that makes an exception of the North and keeps the North in the single market and an All-Ireland economy, mm. linked to, links to an All-Ireland economy, uh, is still in great danger of being compromised mm -hmm. by the British government in the way they've been playing footloose and fancy free with the negotiations. Uh, on that very subject, I mean, I think there was a suspicion at the time that the British government, in not uh, introducing any type of border control would be forcing the onus on the 26 counties mm -hmm. of the Republic of Ireland on behalf of the European Union to put up a border. I think I think that threat is still there. Mm -hmm. But on the issue of the 26 counties, uh, as you know, Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael and the Greens have reached a programme for government which is to go out to their membership. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, how do you view this as a senior member of Sinn Féin, given the fact, of course, that Sinn Féin won the popular vote in the South? How do you see this panning out uh, if they do form a government, how stable a government would be, and what would Sinn Féin's strategy be for uh, combating that? You say Sinn Féin won the popular vote, it'd be easy to forget that when you listen to the media. Um, you know, that the, the Sinn Féin have been sidelined um, and that the vote which was a record vote and you know you're talking about the election in December for me the election um, in the 26 counties the I mean I, I was in various different places whether it was Wexford or Dublin and the buzz and the energy and particularly the buzz and the energy around Mary Lou was something that I've never experienced before and talking to our activists all over the country you were getting fed back that there was there was an, an energy and an appetite for change people wanted something different um, and even when you were getting in canvas and doors you were you know you were talking to uh, people and say for example they would say I've never voted Sinn Féin before but I'm voting for them this time and you would say well if you don't mind me asking why uh, and I was talking to a young fella in Dublin who had a very, very good job, um, wasn't able to afford to get himself somewhere to live. And he pointed to his granny in the, in the corner of the room and said, you know, she was 36 hours in a hospital trolley waiting to get a hip replacement. He said, this isn't, you know, this just, th this has to change. And that anger, that, that desire to live in a society where they're being told Ireland's doing great, but it's not it's not doing great for them. I think that was reflected in the vote that came out. Now, for Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael to see that, to exclude the party that got the biggest vote, and to ignore and I talked about British government. Then they will not go into government. With yeah. Fianna, whilst their position in the north is that there has to be yeah. government between the DUP and Sinn Féin in the north. The the hypocrisy the hypocrisy is astounding. Um, you know, it's it, it's. I was going to say it's dancing on the head of the pen. It's more than that. I mean, it's 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 completely dishonest, and I think that, that isn't going to play well. They aren't capable of delivering the change that people voted for in the election. That I, I think that is a given. Um, even since the program for government was announced yesterday, you can see that they aren't able to get into the detail of what affordable housing means. They aren't able to get into the detail of providing a health service that that, that doesn't um, leave those most vulnerable uh, on the outskirts of society. So I think that Sinn Féin are, obviously, we were ready for government, um, we were excluded, but I think we're going to show what real opposition is. We haven't had opposition um, over the past number of years. It's been sham fights between the Fianna Gael and Fianna Foil, and I think Sinn Féin are now in a position where they will be able to expose the government for, for what they are, and I think that they are more concerned 
with maintaining and consolidating power than actually delivering for the well, people. As someone with a, a mandate and also the cachet of an MP, do you uh, play a part in terms of cross-border bodies? Do you have any dealings in terms of the Anglo-Irish relations and the, the parliamentary bodies that meet? There's um, the Good Friday um, implementation, the Good Friday Agreement implementation, implementation committee, sorry, which uh, which sits in Leinster House, and as an MP, you, you you're automatically entitled to sit on that. Um, but as an MP team, we work closely with our um, Leinster House comrades, and you know, again, it's the benefits of being in an all island party. The you know the joint up thinking w- with regards making sure that everybody is informed, whether that was in response to coronavirus, whether that's being kept up to date with uh, government formation talks, and obviously our analysis of the program for government. So we are, I think, very tight knit, and I think that is um, that that's certainly to our benefit. Do you think the program for government uh, reflects in any real way what is happening here in terms of? moves towards reunification or a reconfigured Ireland? No, I, I think it ignores the reality, not just in the north, but it ignores the reality that's that, that's going on in the island at the minute. Um, the indicators are there from 2017, whether it was, if you want to look at the political indicators, the unionist majority has gone. Um, it, it's not coming back. I, I don't say that, by the way, with any hint of triumphalism. I think that's just a political reality. The December election, for the first time in the history of Westminster elections here, sent back unionism in a minority to Westminster. Um, There are also social indicators, demographic indicators, and then we have Brexit. All of that together has people realising that there is now another option here. That option is provided for by the Good Friday Agreement. And people are looking at their constitutional future, which sounds very grand, but the reality is they're looking to their future and they want an all-island health service. I think that's something that people you know, really tapped into and talked about, especially during coronavirus. And of course they found resources. And they, Yeah, abs- absolutely. They came work there. Yes, exactly. And that was, yeah, I suppose that's, that, that's maybe another question. But, you know, the, the, the all-Ireland dynamic is there. The conversation has been going on. We see the success of Ireland's future. The event that they um, hosted in the waterfront this conversation is happening amongst all classes, all areas of life, and people want and need to know exactly what they would be voting for and voting against. What the Irish government have tried to do, or this programme for government have tried to do, I think is restrict that um, and, and slow that the pace of that debate right down. I think they should have went further. There is a need for a citizens' assembly. that We need to be well informed. One thing that Brexit has shown us is how not to have a referendum on constitutional change. We need to be mature. Um, I talked about being about the importance of discourse and legacy. The importance of discourse in a new Ireland is also very important. And I think there is nothing to fear about that conversation. But the momentum is there. The demographics are there. The political indicators are there. And I think the Irish government should be forced to take this to the next level. A, I'm not even exactly sure myself, and I, I read some commentary on it, and I think even um, constitutional and legal commentators aren't clear exactly what moving towards a consensus means. Um, it, it sounds like waffle to me. So I think that the government need to get a, um, a consultation paper on exactly what uh, unity would look like. They need to constitute a citizens' assembly, and I think we need to set a date. Finally, John, your passion for sport is well known. Do you have any regrets about giving up the All Ireland medal, football medal, for the people of North Belfast? It um, it's funny because I was I was captain of the I was captain of the club last year, and um, I think no sooner had I been elected that it was unceremoniously dumped as captain. But uh, no, I'm I'm going to try and play again this year if I can get the time. I actually I was involved in a in a match down at Crusaders for raising money for cystic fibrosis and I absolutely wrecked my shoulder quite badly and um, it's probably the body starting to talk to me but it's been good to sort of try and keep my fit my fitness up and running um, GA's starting back I think in about a month or so so if I can tape myself together and get myself out in the pits I think I'll, I'll, I'll keep trying until they tell me just stop bringing your boots stop turning up Please don't come back, John. Until they say that, I'll keep I'll keep trying to kick a ball about. Okay. Uh, whilst being the MP for North Belfast. Whilst being the MP for North Belfast. Thanks, Very proud MP for North Belfast.